We're seeing a radical collapse of Christian culture in the world today. Humanity is losing its bearings, its direction, because it's walking in the dark. A lot of people aren't seeking God sincerely. God wants to give a gift to the human race through Jesus. In Him there is no darkness. In God alone is light. In God alone is life. He wants to live His life in you and through you and extend it to the whole world. To be Christian means to live by the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit. That's what Christianity is all about, is saving people. Jesus is inside knocking on the door. He wants to come out. He's alive. He continues to save. The kingdom of God is at hand because the king is on the throne. Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. Peter, tell, uh, Peter Herbeck's with me, of course. You know Peter. Yeah. Peter, tell us a little bit about what we're going to see here and who this person, Bohus, is. Okay, you know, we're working, Renewal Ministries is working a great deal uh, supporting the Catholic Church in different places around the world, almost 27 different countries now. We've been working in Slovakia for many years. And one of the key people we met is this young man, Bohus Zivček. Now, he's gotten older, too, like the rest of us, but now he's a Dr. Bohus uh, Zivček. And he was... Doctor of Theology. Doctor yeah. of Theology, yeah. yeah. And he was, uh, during communist time, as a young man, as a high school boy, he was discipled by a priest named Father Michael Zimkowski, who he will make reference to in this. And we're going to hear a little bit of his story of how he came to know the Lord, his journey, and how the Lord's brought him now to really a place of prominent leadership yeah. in the life of the Catholic Church and helping spearhead evangelization in Slovakia, but also in countries around Slovakia as well, the former yeah. uh, Soviet Eastern Bloc countries, yeah. kind of. So. Yeah. And uh, once a year, we get all the country coordinators together, and Bohus was here, and Father Michael was here, and we're able to do some uh, taping with them to hear from their own mouths uh, their stories. So let's take a look at that, and then we'll talk good. some more. Bohus, it's so good that you could be with us here today, and I'm just so glad that you're going to be able to tell your story to so many people who I know will be very interested in it. So tell us a little bit about you were born, and then what happened. <laughs> yeah, I was um, born in 1968, which was a deep communist time in my country and uh, I was born in a Catholic family but practicing faith was uh, a bit complicated. My mom was a teacher and there were certain uh, you know, classes, groups in the society, they were, they were closely watched by the secret police and the teachers were one of them. So for example when my, my mom uh, wanted to go to the church she had to go to the small village in the mountains but as a kids at home, we do as usual things, uh, you know, uh, serving as altar boys and all the stuff uh, the normal Catholic family do. But um, at the same time, we were aware of uh, the secret police. They were watching us, our activities. So everything was forbidden practically except attending the mm -hmm. normal mass. Yeah, as long as they kept Catholics in the church, yes. they felt it was okay, yes. but you just yes. better not do anything. Yes, no speaking, yeah. and they were a little bit of, you know, um, trying to stop you by the teachers. They were uh, mugging you or laughing at you. I remember one situation when I came after the First Communion, and the teacher called me out of the, uh, uh, the whole class, and, and she said, what did you do on Sunday? And I, I said, I was in the first communion, and, and the whole class was laughing. So, I mean, this kind of... They're trying small, to make fun of people yeah. who are believing yeah, and yeah, practicing yeah. their faith. And, yeah. Yeah. and when we came uh, to the teenagehood, um, uh, suddenly we felt that we need something more, but uh, it was hard to find. And there was a time when I, I met a, a guy who was a young man, uh, and he asked, called me on my bike and asked me, uh, hey, listen, uh, would you like to go to the meeting of the small group? And I, I don't know what, what is it. So uh, he said, uh, uh, yeah, there you, some girls will be there and you know, <laughs> <laughs> this kind of stuff. So I said, okay. That made you more interested. Yeah, huh? yeah. So I went and, uh, and uh, we began to meet every week in a very small group, uh, six, seven people, and trying to read the Bible, trying to share a little bit. And um, it was very constant. Every week for many years, 
we were hiding ourselves in, a, in a houses, uh, changing the places, taking no notes, no pictures because of the, you know, security. And, uh, and after a while, uh, they decided uh, that uh, we could do some retreats. So we began, I was 15, 16, uh, doing uh, two weeks re uh, retreats in the forest. And uh, it was a very adventurous stuff for me as a guy because, uh, you know, just not knowing where you are going, uh, you were, aren't allowed to say anything, even your parents, where you are going, uh, with whom, and so it was very like uh, mysterious everything. Yeah. Uh, but it was big fun, and uh, I think that there was the times when my faith uh, started to grow, and, and and when I met really Jesus as a Lord mm -hmm. during these uh, yeah. small group meetings and yeah. the camps and everything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So that was really like. God's providential care for you, oh, yeah, kind of definitely. having that young man invite you to kind of become part of these yeah. secret groups. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in spite of, of uh, all these difficulties the church had in that time, uh, God was able to find a way how to, you know, uh, catch the young people and, and, and uh, bring them to the uh, faith that is alive. Mm -hmm. And we are very grateful, I mean, like just looking back, uh, to the opportunities we had. There was almost no opportunity, no books to read, no leaders to look at. Uh, and even the priests, uh, they were closely watched what they are talking uh, mm -hmm. at the homily. So uh, to have, um, uh, I would say, leadership or discipleship we experience is really like a miracle mm -hmm. uh, for us. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I didn't know that, that the guy was the priest because he was ordered in, in, in a secret and uh, he, he couldn't uh, do his priestly ministry, mm -hmm. so he just worked as an engineer in a factory. And uh, we, we formed just very close relationship, very uh, like a partners. Mm -hmm. And after 10 years, when I suddenly uh, learned that he's a priest. Isn't, so that, isn't that amazing? <laughs> like, so for 10 years, this young man who is like leading the group, yeah was a secretly ordained priest who was working in a factory yeah. and you didn't even know he was a priest. Yeah. And then 10 years later you discovered he was. What, yeah. what, what, how'd you feel? Um, it was a strange feeling. Of course it was a surprise for us, but at the same time, you know, uh, watching so closely his life for years, I, I could say, um, yeah, there was a testimony that uh, no situation would discredit him as a priest. Mm -hmm. So then I, when I look back, I said, yes, every time, every situation when I watch him to behave was really priestly. Yeah. So uh, I, I got even more honor for him mm -hmm. that because he cannot say I am a priest in many situations, you know, talking to the women or, you know, he was mm -hmm. single. Yeah. So people were wondering why yeah. in your age are still single and yeah. so on. Yeah. But uh, it was really, uh, I would say, life in integrity. So he was able to reveal his true identity when communism collapsed. Yes. Is that yes. basically it was, it? Yeah, it was slightly before the revolution yeah. in 1989. Yeah that we learned that he's a priest. And then after the revolution, he could uh, came, come back to the monastery and mm -hmm. begin his uh, yeah. priestly. And, and open, yeah. And, yeah. So what happened? Did your relationship continue? I mean, what, you know, after, after communism collapsed and free? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was a, a strange thing because uh, doing all this uh, training in the forests, we never thought that we, we could do something openly. Mm -hmm. So we were, somehow prepared and ready for kind of partisan war, you know, in the forest. Underground. Yeah, yeah, underground. But uh, suddenly the freedom was there and we were thinking, okay, what's now? What, how we can continue? And uh, so Father Michael went back to the monastery and I was working in a hospital at that time. And I said, uh, Father Michael, okay, I would like to continue this work, but uh, working in a normal work, I could offer you an hour in a week, maybe. And, and he said, okay, so I, I would like to continue uh, working with you, but I cannot offer you any place, any money, just work. 
<laughs> I can offer you a job, but no yeah. money. No yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I was married already in that time. Uh, was this a girl that you met in the underground? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were in the same group, so uh, yeah. we had known each other from the childhood. And Alan and my wife uh, said, OK, let's try. I mean, uh, she was working as a teacher, so we were uh, living for, from her salary, and I was working in a monastery for breakfasts. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, we were able to continue the work and then uh, s uh, we somehow developed a uh, lay missionary uh, position in a church and, and now we are able to cooperate with the priest uh, in the missions uh, quite naturally. But mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning uh, it was uh, quite a crazy stuff. Yeah. And my parents, you know, uh, usually parents when uh, the son or daughter uh, got married, you know, good job, good uh, place to live, and it was, co for them, was a very silly decision to just work uh, without any salary mm -hmm. at the beginning of the marriage and yeah. small kids. And yeah, yeah, and right now you have four children. Yeah. Yeah, and also the Lord has opened tremendous opportunities for you to serve and to evangelize and to build up the church. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's happening right now? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, and the funny thing is that the uh, town or city where I live is really a very tiny town in a, in a mountain, so n unimportant place uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, at the beginning I was thinking, um, how could God use me in this place? You know, no connection, and even in a communist time the border were closed, uh, no relationships. But after the revolution, uh, suddenly God has opened the doors. Firstly, it was that He was sending the people to us. Mm -hmm. So I was, I, I'm still amazed by the people that already been in our place. Um, I mean, there was a time when people from the United States began to flow into those countries with the, uh, with the help. And, uh, and it was uh, really a, a huge help because uh, we were formed in, in a small uh, word and we need to help from the outside to know how to live in a freedom. So there was a really big uh, help from the people from United States, from regional ministries. And uh, very shortly after the revolution, suddenly there was a lack of uh, uh, activities, a lack of pastoral care. So uh, we got a many invitations to do uh, missions, to do uh, um, pastoral work, retreats for the youth, for the students, mm -hmm. for uh, practically any parish. Mm -hmm. The priests were looking how to uh, revive the parish after the 40 years of communism, what we can do. Uh, um, we have people in a church, what we can do with them. And, and suddenly the things that we were just dreaming uh, of in the communist time, like uh, doing evangelization on the street or doing a big rallies on the stadiums, suddenly it happened. Not only that, but you've become missionaries to other countries too, haven't you? Like you're doing a significant thing in Kazakhstan. Tell, oh, yeah. tell us a little about that. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, when God has opened the door, uh, we began to travel uh, abroad, uh, firstly in the post-communist countries, because what was like a curse for us in a communist time that we had to learn Russian language for eight years. Yeah, the language of the oppressors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, suddenly we realized we have a common language. The, I mean, the huge part of the world. Yeah. When we take Russia and all post-communist countries. So uh, we began with Russian language and then we realized that our experiences of communism is uh, also uh, give us a, like a, a common ground. And we, we understood each other, we can help each other. And, uh, and we were invited um, in, it was in 1999, to uh, help uh, in the mission in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And it was a, another big stay, step for us because uh, up to that time we, we did a short term missions. But Kazakhstan is different. The church is, uh, uh, you know, in a mi minority and, and everything needs to be started from zero. So we are sending people there uh, for at least one year. And uh, about 40 people already spent uh, more than a year in Kazakhstan in those 10 years. And right now we, had, we have two priests, uh, Slovak priests there serving and, and uh, 
for uh, lay people. And it's, it's uh, hard work, mm -hmm. but um, it's really, mm, I would say, missionary field. So. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's just a wonderful story about how the Lord providentially took care of you and eventually your wife and your family and your children and this tremendous partnership with Father Michael mm. and priests and lay people working together right. and helping to really do a new evangelization in Slovakia and now also primary missionary work in Kazakhstan. So thank you so much for Bohus for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate your life and your mission. Thank you, Ralph. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's pretty inspiring, isn't it, it is, Peter? Yeah. You know, what, what, what I think about is that, you know, people have had so much so many more difficult circumstances mm -hmm. than any of us have ever had, yeah. but we might have them going into the future. It's true. And we may need to learn some of those things that, mm -hmm. that Bohus was, was, was talking about, about how to operate mm -hmm. when, when the government is oppressing you type yeah. of thing, you know? And uh, it's just really inspiring to see people like, like Father Michael, you know, for 10 years yeah. working as a factory worker, secretly ordained, reaching out to young people and the fruit that's come from that, you know, the fruit that's come from faithfulness to patiently day in and day out, serving the Lord and reaching out uh, and, and the wonderful things that's happened and the wonderful collaboration between priests and yeah. lay people. Yeah, I, I thought about how, as he's describing the story as a young teenage guy, I thought, think about how teenagers live now in America and, you know, the, the life we live compared to what he was living at that time and the cost yeah. of discipleship yeah. that was already happening in his life. You know, yeah. the challenges, the trials, the, they had to be virtuous enough to keep their mouths closed, to, to discipline themselves, yeah. to not, because the cost was high. Yeah, they Because Father they Michael could have gone to jail. I mean, yeah. people could be put in jail, they could be, you know, interrogated for long hours. It was a big deal. Yeah. So this is what they grew up in and their faith was deepened. And so yeah. we met them not long after the wall went down. Yeah. And it was amazing to see how, even though this powerful communist regime was trying to stamp out and crush any kind of faith, the seeds of faith were powerfully at work under the surface, one heart to another, you know, people sharing. And then it blossomed right when, right when the wall went down, they were able to come out and all of a sudden, you know, we went there for the first time in Slovakia, in that part of the country. It was one of the most beautiful expressions of cross-generational lay and clergy expression of Catholic evangelization I've seen anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Just mm -hmm. beautiful, dynamic. And there was virtue that undergirded these guys by, because of the fact of what they had to suffer and yeah. the cost they had to, had to pay. This made me also think about our contact with Archbishop Tom Kevish, you know, in, yeah, in, uh, in Lithuania. Kornos, Lewis, yeah. Lithuania and, we did an interview with him, and uh, I remember him telling us at that interview, it really struck me, he said, what all these years under communism oppression hasn't destroyed Western materialism yeah. in the process. It's another way of yeah. capturing people's souls and sealing them off from God. Yeah. You know, one was by the force of oppressive ideology. The other one is by the lure of consumer comfort yeah. uh, and materialism and, and putting oneself at the center of the universe. and. So it's just, it's just kind of like we have our own kind of oppression yeah. that's going on right now. We almost need these same kind of networks of relationships in order for people to be able to persevere yeah. in the faith. It's a little bit more difficult, I think, when it's so comfortable. Yeah. When we're being put to sleep with, by so many fun things or so many yeah. distracting things yeah. and, and con consumption of materialism, secularism, all that stuff and the constant uninterrupted life of entertainment that's the part of, just mm -hmm. part of what yeah. makes up American culture now the ease of life, it's not good for the spiritual life to have too much of that kind of stuff. Yeah. In some ways, the challenge that they faced, like even in Poland, we were there many times in the amazing heroic faith that was there, but it was like the, this, what they suffered kept them sharp, kept them clear, kept mm -hmm. them focused, kept them spiritually relying on the Lord and pressing into mm -hmm. the Lord. And now you have the recent popes all saying to us as they come here to the United States and different parts of the West to say, look, people are falling asleep. There's an indifference that is set in. People yeah. don't, they're not paying attention to their yeah. faith. There's a kind of spiritual malaise that's just yeah. hanging over people. And not only that, we're actually living. How we live is very different than what we say we are. You know, yeah. we say we're Catholics, but statistically, yeah. Catholics are living as if, just like people who don't know God at all yeah. or people yeah. who reject God. Yeah, it's, you know, a so, bit, yeah. it's a little like St. Paul says, people have the form of religion, but not its power. Yeah. Like they have the trappings of cultural Catholicism, but interiorly something else has taken control of their soul. You know, yeah. the world, the flesh and the devil, you yeah. know, and, and it's almost like we need to regather uh, mm -hmm. God's people. We need to build those relationships of Christian friendship yeah. and discipleship and support each other in this 
hostile environment. Yeah, that, that's why, you know, again, the recent votes were focusing so strongly on a new evangelization, new evangelization. Well, we've got to go back to the, the call of the gospel. It's a call to repentance. Come out of the way of life you're living now. Come out of that life. Yeah. It's inconsistent with the gospel. Your life's going to be over soon. You're going to face judgment day. The stakes are really, really high. Yeah. So we need to preach the gospel again to awaken people, open them to the power of the Holy Spirit, which leads us hopefully to communing yeah. together and like yeah. they did. They were in small groups, they were sharing their life, and out of that shared life and experience they had came a dynamism and a heart for mission. Yeah. Did you hear the heart of young Bohu? She was saying, yeah. you know, it was adventurous, it was exciting, and there was, uh, he had a taste for the battle. He had yeah. a taste for the conflict between the kingdoms, and he realized, even as a young guy, I've got a role to play. Yeah. And this is going to be exciting. It's going to be challenging. And I'm yeah. living for something larger than just yeah. simply entertaining myself or something, yeah. you know, dealing with my boredom. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the providence of God continues to unfold. Like now that communism has collapsed and now that Western materialism is, is the new danger, the Lord is now knitting these relationships between East and West. You know, yeah. isn't it amazing how the Lord brought us in contact with yeah, it is. Father Michael and, and Bohus and so many others around the world that now we have this like international network of, of, of discipleship and friendship yeah. that's working together and supporting each other it did for, the, for the Lord. It was a little bit like memory lane for me listening to him. Ralph took, took, took me back to 28 years ago, 25 years ago, when the Lord was speaking to us, when he was trying to get our attention mm -hmm. to say, look, uh, I want to use what I've given you for the sake of others. And I remember yeah. Pope John Paul II in that one encyclical said, it's now the time for the church in the West to come and bring its resources in a work of solidarity and communion and mission with those in that part of the world. So here we disposed ourselves to it because we felt like the Lord was calling us to yeah. it. And then I'll never forget uh, Peter Williamson, Dr. Peter Williamson, who's a part of our team. And uh, I had been in Slovakia with Bohush and others. And uh, done some conferences and some of the work he was describing. But as I was leaving the airport, uh, one of the religious sisters there said, we have 10 more things we'd like you guys to help us with. And one of them is we have a house of sisters in Kazakhstan. And some of them speak English. And they told us that young Muslims are coming to their door, knocking on their door, asking, could you teach us about Jesus? Who is Jesus? They said, she said, I think you should be helping those guys, you know, renewal ministry. So we came home and I remember calling you and sharing you that with you. And you said, hey, why don't you... Uh, talked to Peter Williamson about it. I called Peter. While I called Peter, I said, Peter, I have a question for you. He said, but before you, you ask me your question, I want to tell you something. He said, I just got back from Rome. And he said, my last day in Rome, I met a priest from Kazakhstan. And he's going back to be the first rector of the first seminary in the history of the country. And I told him all about Renewal Ministries. And Peter, he's asking us to come to Kazakhstan. So I really think, Peter, we should come to Kazakhstan. <laughs> and I said, Peter, you better sit down because that's why I'm calling you to go to <laughs> yeah, Kazakhstan. Yeah. You know, and so the Lord made it so clear. And, and none of us even knew where Kazakhstan was. Right, right. We had to look at a map and find yeah. out where we were going to go. Yeah, that's know. how we got there. Yeah. Peter went first. And then knowing Bohush, they could speak Russian, as he said. Then this collaboration began. Yeah. And their community was trained and ready to go to help support the new bishop yeah. in the new diocese that was yeah. there. So the collaboration's been a blessing for yeah. us, a great joy and a great adventure. And, you know? and the way it's unfolded, it isn't like we said, let's take a look at the map of the world and decide where we want to work. It's more like yeah. the Lord has led us to different countries and yeah. brought us into different relationships. And it's just a it's just a wonderful way of proceeding with the Lord's work yeah. to kind of try to follow his lead, you know? Yeah. yeah. I was really impressed too. He said that 40 people from his community yeah. have spent a year uh, in, in Kazakhstan. Boy, that's, that's impressive. And, and a couple of priests now, they've, yeah. they've planted there. And I've met some of these young guys. Yeah. And they, it's their passion. Yeah. It's their desire to want to yeah. go to that country, which yeah. is primarily Muslim. Yeah. And to be able to serve the growing church that's there and to lay down their lives. And they've done an amazing job yeah. helping the church grow there. Yeah. Peter, I'm going to uh, just take a little time now to tell people about this new booklet. But when we come back, I want you to kind of lay out the whole vision of what Renewal Ministry is doing all around the world and, and, and tell people how they can participate in different okay, ways. sure. So, be back in a minute. Four popes in a row have now asked us to fervently pray for a new Pentecost. They know that what we need is an outpouring of God's Spirit. I've written a booklet about what this new Pentecost is and how we can personally appropriate more of the Holy Spirit. We'd like to make it available as a gift from us to you. Just call 1-800-282-4789 or go to our website, renewalministries.net. Click on New Booklet and we'll send you your own copy. Come Holy Spirit. Well, you know, 
everything we're talking about here is because it's being orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead and guide and move in our life in the same way. So, hey, send for the booklet. Uh, go to our website, RenewalMinistries.net, and this is going to help you kind of get connected with what the Spirit is really doing in the world today. Peter, expand our vision. Tell, tell everybody everything yeah. that's going on with Renewal Yeah, Ministries. I was thinking again of just... Uh, the Holy Father John Paul II's vision way back, we started with a whole new missionary age is unfolding in the church. And I think Renewal Ministries is a piece of that larger unfolding of a work of the Holy Spirit, a new Pentecost, thrusting us out into the marketplace, both here in the United States and abroad. And so what the Lord's got us doing is television, for example, here in the, in the States, we're doing Choices We Face, also collaborating with some guys doing Crossing the Goal, a show for men. We do two uh, daily radio shows, Sister Ann's Food for the Journey, which has really become one of the most popular yes, radio shows yes. in America. She's really quite good. And she's done, what, 7,000 shows yeah, something or something like, like that, that yeah. over the last yeah. 10 years. And yeah. she had a prompting in a sense a few years ago to want to do that. I do a radio show called Fire on the Earth. It's also not a bad show. You can it's a great it. you show. Can get those shows. And if you can't get it on your local Catholic radio station, you can get it on our website. Yep. You know, you get the radio program, the television program, all on our website, yeah. Renewal Ministries. And we're doing lots of parish missions, conferences, men's conferences, things like that around the country that we're available for, that we love to do, and we have teams of people supporting us. And then uh, we do a lot of work internationally. We call our missions dimension of Renewal Ministries, which is really a collaboration with brothers and sisters on the ground in various countries, bishops, priests, religious sisters, lay people who have a, a passion and a desire to respond to the new Pentecost and the new evangelization. The Lord's opened doors for us to stand with them, to bring resources, you know, financial resources, teaching, support. And uh, we're now working in almost 27 different countries in Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, a little bit in the Middle East, Latin America, places like that. South Pacific. Yeah, the South Pacific. Yeah, Oceanic. I, I don't want to yeah. forget about that. Yeah, yeah, And I think the Lord's brought to us, as we sensed at the beginning, Him saying to us that He had people ready, young and old, Catholics from around the United States and Canada who wanted to join and partner with us, financially partner with us, stand with us in prayer, which we need all. We, we need people to stand with us in that prayer covering, but then people to come and share their gifts you know, who have a passion for mission, people who can speak and people who can preach and come and give testimony to the reality of walking with the Lord over years of their life. People who can pray and do prayer ministry with others. And so if you want to be a part of what we're doing, I'd encourage you to contact us at renewalministries.net. We've got a brand new website there and it's very user friendly and it's great. You can go onto that website and look at all the different dimensions of Renewal Ministries. Prayerfully ask the Lord how you can participate and run with us and support in this great adventure that the Lord has led us into. Yeah, and you know, right on the website, you can donate, uh, and, and donations are tax deductible. Uh, we were covered by a board of directors with Archbishop Carlson from St. Louis as the chairman of our board. Uh, you can send for the free booklet. You can find out our mission schedule. You can see where we're speaking. You can click on a video every day. So uh, come and be a part of the Renewal Ministries family. Till next week, this is Ralph Martin and Peter Herbeck wishing you the very best, a life lived in docility to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm.